Without gospel influence in the world, the world rots. It decays. Salt, that thing Jesus says you are, preserves it. It keeps it from rotting. Salt does a lot of things, actually. Let's, let's look at the utility of salt, okay? You know, Jesus always does this, right? He always grabs things that are, that are familiar to his audience, and he, he brings them in, he pulls them in, and he uses them as illustrations and examples in order to make his point. He's, he's always taking what people understand about the things around them to teach them about the one who's standing right in front of them, himself about himself and what his kingdom is like. He takes things that they understand in order to teach them about things they don't yet understand. So if we're gonna learn our lesson from our great teacher, let's understand the metaphor that he's using, right? What's, this, what's up with this salt thing? I'd caution you to not, not, don't stop at the salt as a seasoning thing. Don't stop at the salt as a seasoning thing. Because sometimes I think this, this verse gets used to mean what we do as Christians is we make things taste good. We, we're, we're supposed to be tasty and attractive to the world. Stop that noise. <laughs> it's not your job to make Jesus tasty to the world on its own terms. Stop believing that. That's like catering to the fussy child at the dinner table playing with his peas. It's not your job to figure out how you can make Jesus go down a little easier. Christians are called to be different, and our differences oftentimes, y'all, are annoying and frustrating to the world. But what they, what they find about us or should find about us is that sometimes when, when nobody else is willing to tell the truth, you will even if it costs you dearly. When everybody else is milking the clock at work and you're still working hard as unto the Lord, that's different. That, that stands out. Now, maybe they don't admire that on the surface, right? Maybe, maybe what they do is they call it prudish. But whatever they call it, they see it's different. That's the kind of seasoning you are unmistakably salty. You're salt, not sugar. You're not here to sweeten things up. You're not here to make Christ more palatable. You are here to show what he's like. And that salt is going to make some people thirsty for him. Praise God, some people are going to come running and say, where can I get some of that living water? Other people are going to say, crucify him. Here's the thing to remember about salt as a seasoning. It is a seasoning. It's one of the uses, right? It's one of the uses of salt. But here's what to remember about salt as a seasoning. It doesn't draw attention to itself. It draws attention to something else. The same is true of light, right? It doesn't draw attention to itself. It shines on what is to be seen. Salt brings out flavor. And so as far as salt as a seasoning goes, you don't make Christ taste better to the world. You bring out the flavor of Christ. Now look, some people don't like broccoli. And you just bringing more of the flavor out of broccoli is only going to intensify their dislike of it. Now you can smother it with cheese. You can smother it with cheese or something else so that the fussy child eats it, but that's not salt. Salt brings out the flavor of what's already there, and what is already there is enough. Christ and him crucified for the sins of man is enough. Some people won't like the way it tastes. Okay, but let's not stop at taste and seasoning, okay? What did Jesus' disciples think about when he uses this illustration? What did they think about when they, when they heard about salt? What did they know about it? What was being communicated to them in that moment and thereby communicated to us now today as his disciples today? We know today that salt does a lot of things. It removes rust. It, 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 uh, it puts out grease fires. It has healing properties. And some of that may have dawned on them too then. But 
they had other day-to-day -day uses of salt that might be kind of foreign to us. Uh, so, so let's look at this. Let's look at um, this verse's parallel in Luke chapter 14, where Jesus says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Similar to what he's saying here. Then he says, it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So it's supposed to be good for the soil and for the manure pile. A key source of salt at this time would have been the Dead Sea, right? And so that when they scraped up and, and, and mined whatever salt was there, that wasn't like our refined iodized table salt with the little girl in the umbrella and it's raining salt on her, right? This was like a full spectrum salt. And, and, and one, of the, one of the bits, one of the components that was there was something that we now call potash that is used for fertilizer. Okay? It's interesting that we're the salt of the earth and one of salt's uses is to benefit the soil itself. But what's more interesting is why. Fertilizer makes good things grow. That's what you do salt of the earth. You make good things grow in the earth. Salt is apparently also good for the manure pile. Just, you know, a little gross here for a minute, but just real life for them back then. They didn't have toilets, right? Didn't have plumbing. And go and poop in your backyard and then you would cover it with salt that would have been in, a, in, in some kind of sealed container there. It was a disinfectant to stop the spread of disease. So we have Jesus telling us, telling his disciples then and telling us now that we are something that helps good things grow and stops bad things from growing. Christians are supposed to be like that. Promote the growth of good things in the world and prevent the growth of bad things in the world. You are meant to be a difference because you are meant to make a difference. We grow good things and we stop bad things from growing. That's what salt does. It promotes the growth of decency and morality and gospel influence in the world. The honoring of God, the hallowing of his name in the earth and love of his law. And it hinders the corruption of the world. Without salt, the world rots, as we said. That's why Christians, more and more Christians should be being encouraged to run for office. Not, not all of you, okay? I'm still trying to talk Ness into it, though. I've got his campaign slogan all worked out. Say yes to Ness. <laughs> it's perfect, right? But seriously, though, we're supposed to engage culture. We're supposed to engage culture. We're supposed to speak up, you know, have some fight in you. Standing for righteousness, y'all, has a purifying effect in the world. The world is infected. The disease is sin. We bring healing to a world infected by sin as we reflect Christ to the world. Now, how does salt lose its saltiness? Jesus says something there, doesn't he? He's hinting at this idea of salt losing saltiness. You know, there's only one way. By being corrupted by other things. That's how it loses its saltiness. But by, by not remaining different and distinct. See, salt is only useful if it's pure. It's, it loses its function when it becomes corrupted by its environment. The quality of salt only degrades when something else taints it, when it loses its purity. You know, salt itself, as we've said already, it's a preservative. But what preserves it? What preserves the preservative? Purity. It only ever loses its quality when other stuff blends in with it. That's how salt loses its taste, its preservative qualities, its ability to make good things grow and to prevent the growth of bad things. Christians only influence the world if they're different from it. They only influence the world if they're different from it. And as I thought about this week, I, 
what is it? What, what, what is it that's creeping in? What is it that's creeping in to the church that's, that's costing us purity and potency? And I'll tell you, y'all, in a term, one of the biggest things that's blending in now and, and having us lose our saltiness, our sting, collectively us as a church in North America, is secular humanistic thinking. Big crazy words, right? If, if you're not familiar with that term, I suggest you get familiar. I say that and some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you that don't, I suggest you get familiar with secular humanistic thinking. It's not a boogeyman, y'all. It's not, it's not chicken little cry in the sky is falling. It's not the boy who cried wolf, all right? There is such a thing as progressive Christianity today that people are defecting to because it plays nicer with the world. And because fewer people hate it, that must be more like what Jesus was. And it is not Christian. It is satanic. Satan always masquerades as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. And then that same, the, the, the very next verse, when Paul's talking about that in 2 Corinthians, he goes on, he's talking about the false teachers, and they say they're, he, they're just like them. You know, that steer people away from the apostolic teaching, the word of God as it was given from God to his disciples. Here's why flirting with secular humanism is dangerous and a present threat to the saltiness of the church. It's because according to secular humanistic reasoning, we're all more enlightened now, right? We, we're all more enlightened now. So we can look at the Bible and see where that was, yeah, that was off base, right? We know better now. We've evolved in our thinking. So we know some of the stuff that took place in the disciples, they were just backwards and didn't really, didn't really know better, but we know better now. That is blasphemy. We know better than the men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit to write down for us this God-breathed word? You start down that road, you will find it as a highway to hell. Questioning God's word. You remember, the peril of man and all of creation began with questioning God's word. Did God really say? Did he really say if you ate the fruit of that tree, you would die? I know I'm a pastor now and I'm supposed to get all hot and bothered and bent out of shape about this stuff. But y'all don't do me like that. You should get hot and bothered too. Jesus didn't say preachers and pastors are the salt of the earth. He said you are. This godless culture of ours is literally fighting tooth and nail for the minds of your children because they're thinking about the future and what kind of people they want in it. And you are not it. And they will make it as easy and as convenient and as comfortable as possible for you to let them disciple your children so that when you're dead, your God and his influence in the world dies with you. They're thinking generationally. Are you? Are you thinking generationally? About what you want to grow and don't want to grow? You are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. You know, I've heard preachers and I've read commentators before that, that say, something, say something like, well, Jesus is teaching us here that he delights in using small and insignificant common things. And that's true, okay? He does do that. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You know, not many wise, not many noble, et cetera, et cetera, right? But that's really missing something here. All of that is true. But that's why context is important, y'all, okay? Before you apply scripture to yourself, you have to understand how it applied to them in the moment, who it was originally addressed to. Salt's common now, sure. Wasn't then. Not to them. It was extremely valuable. 
And that's exactly the point that Jesus is trying to make here. You are the most precious commodity in all the earth. At that time, Jesus is teaching to his disciples, salt was literally one of the most precious commodities in the world. People used to get paid with it. It was, it was, a, it was a form of currency. Roman soldiers, as a matter of fact, were, were, were paid in salt. And that's where we get our saying too, isn't it? You know, he's not worth his salt. He's not worth his wage. It's incredibly valuable. Salt was rare and it was valuable. Sure, it's, it's, you know, it's just stuff from the earth or whatever. It's not, it's not, a, a, it's not jewelry and it's not a, a fancy toy, but it had a more meaningful impact for people than jewels or fancy toys. So much more valuable. You are different from the world and your difference makes a difference in the world.